All right, cold stress. We are done with heat stress. We're done with dehydration. We're not done with thermal regulation. This is the, uh, the other side of the coin. And we're not done with the energy balance equation. We'll revisit that as we try to interpret and understand cold stress. Nice day to introduce this topic as we get this nice cold snap coming in. It's supposed to be, what, minus 35 in the morning tomorrow? Feels like minus 35. We were introduced to the idea of wind chill early on, and we'll feel it coming up. You can hear the wind blowing right now, and standing up here, it's already kind of cold. So cold stress. What is cooling? What happens when we, uh, when we become too cool? We can withstand some variation within normal limits, like we've identified. Plus or minus one degree for core temperature is OK. But what is it about the environment outside, the wind, the temperature that makes us cold, and how much can we withstand? We've even seen some, um, uh, some of the, the limits of cooling expressed in that thermoregulation section when we talked about that uh, terrible science, quote unquote. So we're going to not revisit that, but we're looking at cooling as, um, as an intervention, what happens when we, can, when we become too cool, how we would test that. We can't always rely on the environment outside to give us repeatable results. So how can we use cold in the laboratory? How do we test cold in the lab? You think of a giant fridge, controlled humidity, controlled temperature. Just like we had the heat chamber at the, um, uh, during the sweat test, you can create a cold chamber. But is that realistic? Is it reflective of the situations where this would be an actual stress, where people free living humans would experience the cold. When we talk about what goes wrong, there are mechanisms in place, just like on the heat stress side, that the body employs to try to prevent things from going wrong. So along the way, we have all these adaptations that try to prevent an excessive loss of body heat. What are they? What are the acute changes to cold exposure? What are the consequences of not being able to ramp up those acute um, responses adequately? And then what happens uh, when we start to employ some, some strategies? How can we uh, improve our tolerance to the cold? What are things that happen like on the heat training side that happen with cold training? And there's some really interesting new work. And um, one, one case study that we're going to look at that uh, typifies the the response to repeated extreme cold exposure and how things like brown fat are now thought to um, help insulate and help warm the body. They're, they're um, now a candidate for therapies for diabetes and obesity. Brown fat is a special kind of fat that's metabolically active. Uh, new area of research, it's very little in human adults, uh, a lot more in kids, but there's a really nice body of research to say that this might be something to look for in future. Uh, we'll look at these down the road. But what happens in the cold? What do we do to prevent or stave off large decreases in body temperature? Um, we essentially put on a biological sweater, and then there are uh, physical things that we can do to improve manual function, to improve survivability, to reduce our exposure and um, the threat to life in the cold. So acute and chronic responses coupled with technological uh, inventions or the emergency responses to abrupt cooling. That's kind of the progression that we're looking at. So, cold air exposure. And I'm saying air specifically because cold water exposure is something we're going to talk about, but in the next section. So I want to separate those two ideas here and now. What we talk about in this section is cold air exposure. The difference being that thermal conductivity in water is a lot higher than that of air. So heat readily moves between your body and water. It doesn't as readily move between your body and air. Air is also the, uh, the exposure which might be most familiar or most common. So we want to address that idea first before we get into the specialized scenario of a maritime accident or falling through the ice while ice skating. Something like that is, is generally extreme and not as common as walking across the parking lot to your car. 
where you are exposed to very cold air. So what is it about cold air exposure that results in the gradual loss of body heat? Like heat stress, this is a spectrum. There are a series of things that we're going to point to. They're not on or off light switches. They're ramping up or ramping down. There's progressive um, changes in, in manual function or dexterity and uh, eventual changes in, in, in other things. But cold moves from the stimulus, the air, inwards. So we don't generate cold internally. We don't transfer it internally right away. It seeps into the body. So the skin is the first line of defense. The um, superficial or periphery blood flow would come into play next. And then the core is affected afterwards. And this is somewhat in reverse to how we discussed heat stress because heat was, if you weren't in a... In a, in a tropical environment, and you think in terms of exercise, heat was an internal stress that generated from the inside out and permeated outwards. So uh, exercise heat stress from the inside out, cold air exposure from the outside in. And a lot of uh, this work is a significant military investment because a lot of the, the negative consequences, the, uh, the severe extreme exposures were experienced by individuals in wars in the past, 10% of casualties in World War II were attributed to exposure as the Germans tried to invade and conquer Russia. In their summer uniforms, no less, engines froze solid, guns wouldn't work. Uh, you had to boil water or light a fire under the engines to get them moving again. Some soldiers had their eyelids frozen off. Pretty nasty scenario for what was thought to be a relatively short campaign. Individuals in really light garb, less than we're wearing now, we're stuck outside in, in freezing Arctic winters. Russia, of course, has a similar climate, I would say, to what we experience here. It wasn't only the Germans that suffered exposure. This goes all the way back to 1812. This is Napoleon and his grand army trying to invade Russia. Similar uh, end result, severe frostbite, exposure, deaths attributed to the brutal conditions of the Russian winter. So Russia and Canada were, are nicely poised in that, in that sense to have that natural defense on hand, the environment, the snow, and those frigid conditions. But it's not only um, Germany and France in these cases that are turned away. Russia and their efforts to invade Finland also suffered some rather extreme and brutal exposure. This is in early 1900s. Again, um, ill-preparedness of the Russian soldiers. You can see caked on snow and ice on this individual here as they try to invade Finland. Finland, a relatively hardy people that fended off the invasion quite handily using cross-country skis and uh, long-range rifles, the inspiration for the biathlon at the Olympics. So extreme circumstances causing extreme injury. How do we protect against these injuries and what is the body trying to do on its way from normal function to what we see here being the most extreme case. What is the body trying to do to prevent loss of function, to prevent acute injury? And how would we characterize that loss of function? What is it about this individual that makes him sit here and not get up and operate properly? Now in the extreme cases, since we're already on this topic, in the extreme cases, like we framed heat stress in terms of its injuries, uh, heat exhaustion, heat illness, heat stress, cold has a similar set of injuries that if left unaddressed can cause some pretty severe damage. And they're generally grouped into two main categories, cold wet or cold dry injuries. Now I've already tried to separate air exposure from water exposure, but that doesn't mean that cold wet injuries and cold dry injuries can be similarly split. Cold wet injuries can also be experienced in an environment like this with howling winds and uh, blowing sleet and snow. These typically though are not a result of cold exposure per se, but prolonged immersion. Fluid redistributes across the skin, edema and swelling occur, 
This happens in the cold as well, and these conditions are often obvious in cold situations, but they can occur in warm weather as well, where there's just um, persistent immersion. And the tiered, um, the tiered injuries are shown here, chillbane, pernio, and trench foot. Chillbane being um, itchiness, redness, usually on the backs of the feet. The feet are, are always the susceptible extremities, the feet and the hands, but we're, we're often pretty good at trying to protect the hands. Itchiness, redness, swelling, irritation, um, some minor ulcers or breaking of the skin. That's chillbane. Not something that we've probably experienced, right? Not in an extreme case. You might have had frost nip or frost bite that we'll talk about shortly. But these are rather extreme uh, conditions resulting from cold, wet exposure. Pernio is just chillbane times two. Larger ulcers, lots of itchiness, and some necrosis, or the skin starts to die. Cells start to burst, they swell too much. Maybe it's a secondary effect of constant itching or abrasion, but there are larger ulcers with necrosis of the skin. And this is generally irreversible. So at this point, there are, um, there's damage done that can't be easily reversed. And then trench foot, the extreme case of pernio, where the limb or the extremity becomes non-functional and might need amputation. Trench foot, uh, so named for its high incidence in World War I. Water pooling in the trenches, people running back and forth in the trenches, and this occurring in the feet because that was what was exposed mostly. Um, large vascular damage, so uh, bruising and a uh, little sensitivity, uh, nervous damage as well. The, the ends of the nerves become desensitized and damaged here. The uh, ulcers are evident that we see in pernio, the um, itchiness and redness of the skin, also evident. But the loss of sensation in this case remains forever. It can't be reversed. You don't gain sensation back. Uh, you don't gain the control, the fine dexterity that you had before back. This is a permanent injury. So you can induce these in warm water. <clears throat> but more often than not, they occur with uh, cold water exposure as well. They tend to appear together. Now, cold, dry injuries are those that we are more familiar with, perhaps. Frostbite being what we uh, um, were brought up with understanding from a young age. It's pretty severe. You don't want frostbite. Your, your um, skin dies. It's, it's best to avoid it. Wear a hat, wear gloves. Frostnip being a smaller version of frostbite. Both of these result from cells crystallizing and bursting. So whereas the cold, wet injuries were edema and swelling of the cells with eventual bursting, these are freezing of the, um, the cell membrane, popping or, or a fracture of the cell membrane, and then the associated deficits in function from those cells dying. The difference between them is that frost nip is only a superficial damage. So superficial epithelial cells, skin cells, might be damaged, might freeze, and burst. Generally, this isn't damaging. You'll feel tingling. It'll feel warm as you try to rewarm it. But there's no risk of infection. The, uh, the damage doesn't penetrate the skin uh, that far. So there's no risk of the vasculature picking up anything from the outside, bacteria or anything else. It's just uncomfortable. And there might be a transient loss of sensation, but they eventually return to normal as the, uh, the skin renews and replaces itself. <coughs> Frostbite, on the other hand, a deeper version of frostnip. Skin cells and the underlying basement membranes, some of the, uh, the smooth muscle cells and the vasculature can all also be susceptible to that freezing and bursting. And this creates a portal in from the environment. So it essentially creates a hole in the skin through these damaged cells where bacteria and viruses can enter. There's a really large risk of infection 
requiring amputation with frostbite. Skin dies, you see it colored purple, there's never a, a return of sensation, sometimes the whole limb has to be taken off, or just that section of, uh, of skin, that area of skin. Big time pain as uh, some sensation returns to the, uh, the individual nerves at the end, risk of infection with rewarming, very severe uh, version of frost nip. So there are things in place physiologically that try to prevent these issues, but obviously they have limited capacity in the face of these extreme winters, um, constant exposure, these injuries will prevail. Why? What is it about cold air exposure and persistent cold air exposure that results in these cold injuries? From a physical point of view, we can refer to the heat balance equation. We know this well. This was done on the midterm. Everyone answered this quite well. One small point that we'll talk about that was a common catch point for a lot of you. But uh, we have heat balance as a function of metabolism work, radiation, conduction, convection, evaporation. One of these, at least one of these, must be the inroad of cold from the environment to the body. It must be the stress placed upon the body by cold air. What would it be? So if we are cooling, heat balance is negative. If we are losing heat, heat is flowing out of the body, cold is flowing into the body, we are becoming more cold, heat balance is negative. This describes the process where I walk outside and become cold. If I'm out there for a long period of time and I am cold, I'm no longer changing core temperature. I'm already reached whatever cold core temperature I'm going to reach. If I'm no longer changing heat flow, S is zero. And this was the, the, the catching point that caught a lot of you in the midterm. The question was asking, assume you are at steady state in a hot environment. How would each of these elements impact heat flow? Steady state indicates there's no change in heat balance. So heat flow is balanced. It's zero. It's not positive or negative if you are at steady state, if core temperature has stabilized. That means that the sum of these things is zero. If one is positive, there must be a negative term somewhere else that counterbalances it. But as we move from a comfortable situation inside to an uncomfortable situation outside, and I begin to cool, if heat flow is negative, that means the net sum of these factors is negative. They're not balanced yet. Something is causing me to lose heat. At least one thing is causing me to lose heat. So at least one thing is zero in this equation. If I open this window and I start to cool my own body temperature, one of these things would be zero. What would that be? It's not metabolism. It's never metabolism. It's always positive. It's an inefficient process. Some of the energy is used to do work. The rest is dissipated as heat. Metabolism is positive or zero if we're not exercising. It's never really zero because there's always metabolism going on, even if you're sitting here quietly. It's just a small positive number. So that's not our candidate. Work might be our candidate. It's negative, right? Work is always negative. It's work that's being done. It's heat energy that's being captured by the bicycle. Or heat energy that's being transferred to the pavement as you run down the sidewalk. Work is negative, so that would make heat balance negative. But the caveat is, work is only negative when metabolism exists. Metabolism is the thing that does work. And metabolism is much larger than any negative influence of the work being done. And so it's always overridden. You can't have work as a term isolated and alone in this equation. If there is work, it must be done by something. And it's done by your conscious choice to exercise. Metabolism supplies the energy to do work and much more than the, uh, the work requires. So it is negative, it's a candidate to make this equation negative, but it's always overridden.
So it's really, it's never the answer. That leaves these last four terms. Radiation would imply for that to be negative and cause us to lose heat, we would have to emit radiation. We would have to lose, well, what would that be? Uh, gamma rays, x-rays, infrared radiation. We'd have to emit radiation from the body, which maybe we do in the infrared spectrum, but it's very, very low. Humans don't tend to emit a lot of radiation. We're not radioactive. The influence of radiation on the body is usually always positive. If the sun is out, even on a cold day, we are absorbing some of that radiative heat. So this is unlikely to be our candidate. There isn't a negative outflow of radiation from the body to the environment ever. The last two, or last three candidates, are really where we can get some variation. And depending on the day, these are the three that are responsible for, uh, for cooling. Conduction and convection, by far, the biggest factors. The biggest um, factors that influence or cause a negative heat balance. In cold air, without it moving, conduction is negative. The body is warm, the air is cold, heat will move between those media from high to low temperature, or high to low heat load. If the wind's blowing like it is right now, we renew that gradient, it's easier to move heat down a large gradient, and so conduction and convection work together to maintain a negative outflow of heat. Now, I say primarily conduction because if the gradient weren't there, convection couldn't remove heat on its own. There needs to be a gradient established. Therefore, conduction needs to move from the body to the environment, or heat needs to move according to conduction from the body to the environment. Convection just renews the gradient. So convection alone isn't responsible for the negative outflow of heat. Both work together, primarily conduction. The last one might be a little tricky. We're looking for things that make the heat balance equation negative to describe what physical processes result in heat loss. And evaporation is always negative. This is one factor that always results in heat loss. This was the, the biggest avenue of heat loss on the heat stress side. If heat load became too large, we engaged evaporation because we have this massive ability to dissipate heat to the environment. But in the situation of cold air exposure, in a situation where we're not sweating, is evaporation a large contributor to heat balance? The answer is no. If there is nothing to evaporate, there's no influence of this on the heat balance equation. Now, there is always some evaporation occurring. And in cold air, we're referring to the insensible evaporation that we discussed very briefly in the thermoregulation section. That is, insensible loss of fluid through the skin. There's always a little bit of fluid at the skin, even if you're not sweating. The cells are hydrated, right? And there's evaporation from the airways. So air goes in, air goes out. The job of the airways is to humidify and warm the air. Some of that humidity can escape. And that's especially a concern with low water vapor pressure, which happens at altitude. So down here at sea level, we have a really high relative humidity on a nice hot summer day or any time there's a high relative humidity. Water vapor pressure is high. It's unlikely we're going to lose any respiratory air to that environment. But in a situation where water vapor pressure is low, where the air is very dry, it is right now, all the water in the air is frozen. In a situation where water vapor pressure is very low, that creates a really nice gradient to lose uh, fluid from the airways to the environment. So really cold day like today, this can occur. 
It occurs a lot at altitude. Water vapor pressure is much lower um, at altitude. It's low in the cold and it's low at altitude. Conveniently, altitude and cold are often a combined stress. Think about mountain climbers. Cold and altitude are often combined. You don't often see this, um, or altitude at least independently. We see cold independently here, but uh, if you move to altitude, you will also see cold as a stress. So evaporation is always negative. It has a small role to play in making the heat balance equation negative in response to a cold air stimulus. Conduction and convection are the main factors. Conduction being primary, convection renewing that gradient. That's where the, uh, the trouble lies. So we want, as the body, to minimize conduction and convection. That's the body's plan in response to walking outside with no coat on. How do I limit negative heat flow? How do I maintain core temperature? I want to reduce the influence of conduction and convection. So the, the responses that we're going to talk about today are meant to reduce conduction and convection, limit the magnitude of those, uh, those factors in losing heat. So how do we study this? How do we know um, magnitudes of conduction and convection? How do we know which is responsible for um, preserving body heat in response to the cold? How do we impose cold? We can do it outside on a day like today, or we can do it in the lab in a specialized chamber. You saw the, uh, the mirror image of this chamber two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. The heat chamber that we have set up over in, uh, in West Street, it's nice and hot, nice and humid. This is the opposite. This is a nice big fridge or freezer. The, um, the VO2 hoses you can see are insulated. This fellow's wearing a lot of nice insulated clothing. It's very cold in this environment. You can make it colder or uh, drier. Uh, an environmental control chamber to make um, a cold environment to test these responses. And in this kind of chamber, you can measure performance, like you see here. I don't actually know what this is measuring, but you can imagine these are all ECG leads. You've got VO2 being measured. You're probably, well, maybe they're not ECG, maybe they're skin temperature leads. This is probably a uh, uh, clothing and apparel type study. A lot of the work that's done here is in how do we boost the body's normal defenses to cold air exposure? So if someone's running, how do we create vents and pockets that allow them to thermoregulate while not losing too much heat? Or what about the material, the fabric of this jacket? How do we create a fabric that is breathable but um, also insulates the individual? So these are probably skin temperature leads, not ECG leads, measuring VO2 as well. So we can measure physical capacity like this. Pretty easy in a cold environment to measure VO2, measure VO2 max. You can measure differences in, in uh, body temperature at the skin. Um, you can measure core temperature as well if there's a, a probe and a lead we can't see. Um, one complication with cold air exposure that we didn't see on the heat stress side is assessments of manual function manual function or dexterity. When we were faced with heat stress, we only cared about losing heat. We only cared about thermoregulation, but everything worked pretty well. You might start to feel fuzzy, the cognition started to go off, but you could still contract the muscle. Um, you could still voluntarily activate the muscle pretty well in the heat. In the cold, it's a little bit of a different story. Depending on how cold different regions of the body get, that, that cold can really limit normal function. It deforms the uh, neuromuscular junction and it closes off blood flow. The muscles in those areas can really have a, a significant and measurable reduction in function. And this is really important for, uh, for manual function, dexterity of the fingers, because 
in a situation like this. You want to make sure that you can get yourself out of it. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, this environment allows us to measure physical capacity. You can have dexterity tests doing little nuts and bolts or um, measuring placement of different, uh, different size things in a stack. There's a whole bunch of different physical capacity and manual function tests like we saw with the cognitive function tests to uh, assess manual function. But the most extreme and perverse type of test in this environment is what we would call a cold stress test. And an example of a cold stress test is four and a half hours spent in a 10 degree Celsius chamber, which doesn't sound very cold. It's above freezing. With 18 degree water being showered onto you, which also doesn't sound very cold. It's cooler than body temperature, but it's not freezing plus wind. So we're maximizing conduction. We're maximizing convection. The gradient to both the water and the air is a large. Consider that the body temperature is 37 degrees. And our response to this kind of cold stress can give us insights into whether the cold response is trainable or whether a certain type of countermeasure can help survive, uh, help us survive or improve survive, uh, survivability in extreme situations. It's a, a slightly more ethical version of the cold water immersion that we use to figure out the minimum core body temperature that a person can survive. Even still, that this is a bit uh, more ethical. You imagine someone looking like this, shaking in the sleet and the snow, in a nice cold room. And actually, one thing that I forgot, these tests are often used to um, evaluate the, the shivering response. I'm getting ahead of myself, that's one of the countermeasures to, uh, to try to stay warm. There's a whole field of research to investigate when does shivering turn on, how much does it turn on, what are the fuel supplies for shivering, how can we maintain it for longer periods of time? And you would use a stress like this to induce shivering and measure um, activation of the muscle in the quadriceps or the arms or the back, where around the body the muscles are active and how uh, extreme the, the quivering contractions are. Really hard to get by ethics, something like this. So a myriad of different tests. Basic environmental control, we can do different tests in that refrigerator or we can have someone standing outside in the sleet and snow. We can do acute exposure outside, but it's not as repeatable. We can't set 10 degrees uh, Celsius air. We can't set 18 degrees Celsius uh, water and wind. We can't set the wind velocity, but maybe it's a bit more natural. Here's an example of um, a slightly modified version of that kind of environmental uh, laboratory. This is not a refrigerator. This isn't a, uh, a heat or a cool chamber. This is a lab in uh, the UK that specifically deals with uh, divers and maritime exposure where they um, test the diving response. The diving response in mammals is, um, for some reason, when our faces are immersed, the nervous system is depressed. Heart rate slows, ventilation slows, breathing slows. Which is good because when your face is immersed, you can't easily breathe. Water is blocking any air that would go into your lungs. And so there's a nice cold tub here with water that you can wash the face of the individual and there are different ways to test the diving response. We don't know why it happens yet. Uh, we're not sure how long it can uh, persist or what factors can modify it. Um, but this is a lab in the UK that aims to improve maritime survivability for, uh, for accidents at sea. So they're only using an isolated cold water uh, face wash and immersion tub in the middle of the laboratory with a bunch of other equipment. We did something really similar in, uh, in the summer this past year, but um, you can tell there's, there's a fair amount of grant money going into a, a lab like this. You see a lot of really high-tech equipment and some nice stainless steel uh, wash basins.
We had to make do with a $40 inflatable tub that I got off Amazon to do a cold water immersion study. And the cold room, you can see the air conditioner going on in the back here, never quite worked out. The room never got cold enough. So we were forced to only use cold water in this inflatable tub. And um, the way that we, we made cold water, um, we did 10 degree cold water with giant ice blocks. So we took a, a basin about the size of this overhead projector filled it up with ice, stuck it in the freezer. Giant ice cubes, bigger ice cubes than you can imagine. Put that in a tub full of water and let that thaw. Gets it down to 10 degrees, actually pretty repeatably. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty robust to, uh, to get it down to 10 degrees. And then we tested performance before and after. So a little bit of a difference between our makeshift cold chamber and uh, some of the more advanced labs in the world. Um, let's take a break. We have...